In Matthew chapter 6, we're just about right smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and we are taking four messages, this is one of four messages, dealing with one particular section, which is chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. So turn to Matthew chapter 6. This morning we're going to start in verse 5. But as you're finding your place there, I thought it was good as we begin our time in the Word today just to acknowledge this. Jesus, of course, here is warning against being a hypocrite. He says it three times, don't be a hypocrite. Clearly, he's telling us here not to be a hypocrite. But I think it's good for us to admit up front this morning that there is a bit of hypocrite in all of us. There's a bit of hypocrite in all of us. Now, just think about that tendency to hypocrisy. It's really part of our fallen condition. Think about our first parents, Adam and Eve, when they're in the garden. What's the first thing they did after they realized the consequence of their sin, that they were naked and that they were ashamed before God? What did they do? Well, they tried to hide that truth. They sewed fig leaves to try to cover their nakedness. They hid themselves. They didn't want what was true to be seen. And so that natural uh, hypocritical tendency, we'll call it, is part of our fallen condition, is part of our nature, and I think we can see that and, and admit this morning that there is that hypocritical tendency or impulse in us all. Think of it this way. Let's say one of the married couples here in our church, you really have to use your imagination for this, but let's say on the way to church, they get into a little spat in the car. Okay, just a little spat. Maybe even they're pretty mad at each other. But when they get to the church, I dare say this, that when they walk in the church door, they will not continue to argue. Think I'm right? I'm pretty safe in saying that, aren't I? They will not continue to argue once they get inside the church. And I might even go the far as to say this. There's probably a smile on their face. And if you said to them, hey, brother, how's, hey, sister, how you doing? They might even say, great, fine, good. Now, listen, I got to tell you, there's that, that hypocritical tendency and impulse in my own heart. Because you know what? I'm glad you didn't continue the fight inside the church. I'm really glad you didn't. And uh, wh why? Because this is Emmanuel Happy Church. Did you know that? Oh, it is. It's just Emmanuel Happy Church. He's just happy everywhere. And would somebody please throw a sheet over the couple that's arguing in the foyer? <laughs> because this is Emmanuel Happy Church. Now listen, I think there's a sense in which the, the more we grow to get beyond that, it's good. But there's also a sense in which we wouldn't want everyone to know everything about us until we are with Christ and he has redeemed our fallen nature. That wouldn't be a good thing. I'm just saying this. There's that tendency, that impulse to be hypocritical. Now, what Jesus is dealing with here in the Sermon on the Mount, it's, it's similar, but it's something far more significant than just that tendency to hypocrisy or, or that impulse to hypocrisy. Because what Jesus is dealing with in these verses is more of a deliberate, more of an intentional hypocrisy. It is, it's deliberate. It's something I would even say is more sinister. Because here Jesus is warning us about using pious acts. Now again, we define pious acts or piety as ways that a heart's devotion is expressed to God. So if you're expressing your devotion to God, you might do that through giving, you might do that through uh, praying, you might do that through fasting, that would be the examples that Jesus is using here. But the hypocrisy that he's talking about is using these pious acts in order to create an appearance, to create an appearance or an illusion of righteousness. And in the creating of that appearance or illusion of righteousness, I receive the praise, applause, the commendation, maybe even we would say the worship 
of others. You see, this is misdirected worship. It's it's putting ourselves in the place of God. This is blatant idolatry because it diverts praise from where it should go and should only go to God and the glory of God to someone else, and namely ourselves. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. And then in verse 2, he tells why they want to be seen. Because in verse 2, he says that they may be praised by others. So this warning that we're given here in verse 1 is fleshed out with three specific examples of piety. Or how inner devotion to God is expressed. Giving, we looked at that a couple weeks back, Uh, giving to the poor, praying, and fasting. Now, we're going to look at prayer this morning in verses 5 through 15. So if you found your place there in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 5, if you're able, why don't you stand with me as we read the Word of God together this morning. Matthew chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 6, and beginning in verse 5. Jesus said, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And may God bless the reading and hearing of his word. And may God grant the gift of receiving his word into our hearts this morning. Let's pray and ask that he would do that. Father, this is a text about praying. And so, Father, we, we begin this, this time in prayer asking that your spirit would teach us and lead us. That, Father, we would not only receive this instruction about prayer, but we would see it in that larger context in which Jesus is warning us about being hypocrites, of of using pious acts as a means of attracting the attention of others that we might be praised and applauded, even worshipped by them. God, help us see the sinfulness of that kind of idolatry. And then, Father, help us to to express our devotion to you in praying the way Jesus taught us to pray. So, Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. And as you're seated, again, remember as we look at these three examples of piety, that there's this similar pattern. Jesus tells us how not to give, pray, and fast. And then in contrast to that, I think that's really important if we're going to understand what Jesus is teaching here. He's teaching this in contrast to something. So what he holds up as to what you should do, he's holding it up in contrast to something that you should not do as you pray. So let's begin with how we should not pray according to Jesus. There it is in verse 5 again. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. 
For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Now I want you to notice these words. Notice these words carefully. These are very revealing words. When Jesus said this, for they, what's the next word? Love. For they love to stand and pray that they may be seen by others. And we know that that motive of being seen by others back in verse 2 is that they would be praised by them. My brothers, my sisters, be careful about the things you love. Be careful about the things in this life you set your heart's affection upon. Be careful about what you love because it is your love that is always going to be the foundation, the basis of what you do. What you do is going to be the fruit of what you desire, of what you want. Whatever it is you set your heart on, whatever it is you want, whatever it is you desire, Jesus here uses the word love. They love Be careful about the things you love because your doing is always the fruit of your desire, of what you love. That's why we need to take this wisdom to heart, this wisdom of the Proverbs. Proverbs 4 and verse 23, keep your heart with all vigilance. Keep it. I believe it's the New American Standard. If you have the New American Standard, and I'm wrong on this, it's another version, but I think it's the NASB that says, guard your heart. Above all, guard your heart because from it flow the springs or the issues of life. Guard your heart. Brother, sister, be careful about the things you set your heart on, the things you love. Your desire is more fundamental than your doing. Let's put it this way. You do what you do because you want what you want. And what you want is always going to be a reflection of what you truly love, what you value, what you treasure. We could even say what you worship. The most important question is not, what did I do? But if I want to ask a question that's really going to help me counsel my heart, that's really going to help me get to the heart of what I'm doing, I need to ask the question, what did I want? What did I want? Because it's my wanting, my desire, that's always going to be the foundation of that doing. Parents, keep that in mind. Keep it in mind. You know, it's so easy to to look at our children, at what they're doing, and then make judgments on that, and then bring discipline or reward just based upon what they're doing. Uh, so, So they do something that is wrong, And so if we just deal with that, the wrongness of that, whether it's discipline or whatever we bring, we're not really getting to the heart of the matter and we're not helping our children really see themselves in a way that is most helpful to bring change. It's not just what did you do. We need to get to the why. But listen, with your children, you know as I know that the why question is difficult because when you ask your children, why did you do that, what do they typically say? Thank you, you're right about that. I don't know. Why did you pull your sister's hair? I don't know, just, it was there. You typically, if you say why, but it's important to get to the why. And so ask the question, what did you want? What were you wanting? This will begin to get to the why of it. This will begin to get to the heart of the matter. Because what you want, what you desire, is always going to be a reflection of what you love, what you worship, what you really treasure. And we always do what we do because we want what we want. And the reason we want it is because of what we truly love and desire. All right, let's get back to Matthew 6. Here are these hypocrites standing up in the synagogues and the streets and praying probably these pompous platitude prayers. Why? Well, because they love the applause. They love the praise. They're, they're portraying an image. And this image is, wow, 
What a righteous person. Now there's somebody that knows God. Just look at that. So they, we might put it this way, they stand up in order to stand out. And they want to stand out because they want the praise, the applause, even the worship of others. That is so key to what we're talking about here. They stand up in order to stand out. You see, this is, again, this is revealing what's in the heart. It's not just looking at what they're doing, but Jesus is getting to the heart of why they're doing what they're doing. It just dawned on me this morning, actually in the first service, that as we're playing that, that uh, sermon intro video, and I knew what I was going to be saying, and I, just, I was sitting there and I thought to myself, I have to stand up and go up there and, and deliver this message. I kind of wanted, it, it, it caused me to set back a little bit. Jesus says, they love to stand up. They love it. I, gotta, I have to stand up. I mean, I suppose I could sit down. But you know what I'm saying. To come up and to preach a message, to come up and to pray, you have to stand up. But here's the key. Why do you stand up? And you pray for your pastors. You pray for this pastors. Every, every Sunday I stand up and come to this pulpit with an open Bible. You pray that your pastor will stand up. Not to stand out. Not to stand out to get applause and approval of others. But to stand up and to open up this word that God in heaven would be glorified, that the truth of who God is would be revealed. Not only his love and mercy, but his holiness and his justice. Because as we see that revealed in the word, it's going to lead us to a cross, an empty tomb. Because at that cross, an empty tomb, we see the true justice and love and mercy of God on display. And it is that work of Christ that all of us desperately need to be made right with God, to know God, to truly worship God. So we have to ask ourselves, why do we stand up? Is it to stand out? Or do we stand up? that God would be glorified, that God would be praised. Now, it's all about the heart, isn't it? That's why we can't really judge others in these matters. When we get to chapter 7, Jesus is going to say, don't, don't judge. We can't judge hearts, but we can certainly, we must judge our own hearts, can't we? Shouldn't we? Must we? Notice verse 5, what, what Jesus says here in verse 5, and this I really, I think this is something that you, you find throughout the Bible, what God reveals about himself. Because notice, the one who's standing up in order to stand out, that they might receive glory and praise and worship. Notice what Jesus says again in verse 5, the second part of it. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Isn't it amazing that God gives people what they want? That's what the Romans 1 passage is all about. Three times, Paul says, God turns them over. God turns them over. He turns them over. He gives them what they want. And here, if you stand up in order to stand out, in order to get the glory and praise of others, you'll get what you want. Good on you. But it's not lasting, is it? And it's really not satisfying. And it's certainly not what points to the beauty and the glory and the righteousness of God. So don't stand up to stand out as you pray. Now, you'll notice that Jesus says what not to do, and then he says something in counter to that, how you should pray, and then how not to pray, and then how you should pray. So let's jump to the second, how you should not pray. 
because he says in verse 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their, or for their many words. In the context here, Gentiles would be talking about peoples who are outside the covenant people of God. So they don't have the word of God. They don't have the covenants of God, the promises of God. Uh, They don't know God as the people of God should know God. So those Gentiles, the the people out there in the world who don't know God, that's, that's the Gentiles who they represent here. What was the Gentiles' way of praying? Well, they didn't believe in one almighty God. They thought that there were many gods and that these many gods had jurisdiction over different spheres of life. So you had the fertility God, you had the harvest God, you had the protection God, you had all these different gods. Then they believed about these gods that they could be manipulated into doing the will of the petitioner. And Jesus describes here how they, how they would do that manipulation. Now, there's several different ideas as to what Jesus means when he says they heap up empty phrases. But those words, by the way, are translated from one word, which means to babble. And so I think that the best explanation is, that, is, is this. They heap up empty words or they babble, babble on and on and on so that they will be heard by their many words. Because the thinking was... You drive the God crazy until he finally gives you what you want. You just babble, 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 babble. And then finally he gives what you want. I think of that commercial. I was advertising a a certain program where it had the the boy beside his mother's bed. The mother was doing her best to try to ignore him. He was going, mom, 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 mom. I mean, and it really got annoying So finally she had to give. She finally gave what? Mom, mom, mom. I think that illustrates how these these people who don't know God, they don't know the word of God, they don't have the covenant, therefore they don't trust the promises of God, how they saw the gods, these impersonal, distant deities that had jurisdiction over life. And so if you needed something, you would babble, 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 drive them crazy to manipulate them to do what you would want. Now, in contrast to that, Jesus is going to tell us how to pray. Both how to pray in relation to the problem of those who stand up to stand out and in relation to those who babble, 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 babble in order to manipulate. So I would say the first thing we should notice, let's just make this point real quick. This is implicit, not explicit in the text. But just notice the attention that Jesus gives to praying. Because there's 18 verses here in this section about hypocrisy. Seven of the 18 verses record what Jesus says about prayer. Sometimes there's a message just in the emphasis. And so it would seem like the most important, significant kind of heart devotion to God, just the simplest, is prayer to God. So that's why I think there's so much emphasis that Jesus gives to praying. Now, everything that Jesus says about praying, I think we could capture with these three phrases. The first is this, it's done in secret, not for show. It's done in secret, not for show. Number two, it's personal, not impersonal. And then number three, it's petitioning God, not manipulating God. So it is praying that is in secret, not for show. Again, verse six, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, remember, as, as we interpret different texts of the Bible, every, every teaching has to, be, has to hold the weight of all the rest of Scripture. So Jesus here is not giving a prohibition against any of his people praying publicly. And I would say that because the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2 is very clear. He says that men everywhere should pray. What does he mean by that? Well, clearly in the 1 Timothy 2 context, everywhere is talking about every place of worship. Paul also instructed Timothy, give attention to prayer and the public ministry of the word. And so in every place, Christians are to pray. So to have someone in the church, one of our men, 
come and to lead us in prayer is not a violation of what Jesus is talking about here. Remember, what Jesus is saying here is in contrast to something. It's in contrast to the one who's standing up in order to stand out. It's in contrast to the one who's trying to present some certain image about themselves in order to attract and to receive the praise and worship of others. So in contrast to that, Jesus is saying, look, when, when you pray, you're going to go into your, your quiet place, your private place, and there quietly, secretly commune and fellowship with God because your communion with God Your devotion to God is something that you share with Him, with Him alone. The whole purpose of this isn't to attract others' attention. The purpose of this is for you to express your love, your devotion to God as you pray. So Jesus says, go to your, your prayer closet, we might say. Get alone, be private. And there, in your privacy, in the quietness, commune and fellowship with your heavenly father again jesus is very practical here he says go into your room and shut the door this this not only is beneficial so that you you're guarding against that inclination to want others to see you're guarding against that but you're also blocking out other things other distractions around you it's it's a quiet place that you might commune with God. He implies that there's a specific place and a sanctified time in which you pray. We'll come back and talk about that in a moment. But notice also Jesus teaches here that praying is personal, not impersonal. So in contrast to those who don't know God, they imagine some impersonal, distant deity out there that they're going to bug to death in order to get something that they want. In contrast to that, Jesus says, you're praying to your Father. You're, by, by the way, 16 times, 16 times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus refers to you, to one of his followers, to you and God, as you and your Father, or your Heavenly Father. Now let that sink in for a moment. Instead of how the the Gentiles, those people who are outside the covenant of God, they don't know the word of God, they don't have the promises of God. Instead of that, instead of thinking of God as this distant, uninterested, uninvolved deity, you are praying to your heavenly Father. There's something massively powerful in that when you let that sink in the God of heaven the almighty God of heaven the God who spoke this universe into existence by the power of his word says come to me child talk to me son talk to me my daughter oh what a difference there is between how these unbelieving people who don't know God think about prayer and those who do know him, those that are his children. This is personal, not impersonal. Then thirdly, this is about petitioning God, not manipulating God. Now, we would all recognize that there's more to prayer than just petitioning God, but it's certainly not less. Prayer is not less than petitioning God. I found it, uh, I just did a a quick survey of prayer in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When I say I did a quick survey, that's code for don't trust this to be absolutely true. (laughs) But I tried to do a quick survey, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I looked up all the teaching of Jesus about prayer, and it was interesting to me that almost always when Jesus is teaching about prayer, He's teaching about petitioning your father. He's, he describes prayers coming to God. He says, ask. He says, seek. He says, knock. 
ask God. Listen, prayer is about petitioning God. It's more than that, but it's certainly not less than that. But here's the difference. You're petitioning your father. You're not trying to manipulate him. And here are the words that make that so clear. The words in verse 8. See it again what Jesus said in verse 8. Do not be like them. For Look at these words. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. See, that takes the manipulation completely out of it. He already knows what you need. God is going to do for you, he's going to give for, to you what you need. He is your father. Another place Jesus taught that when you ask God for something you need, he knows what you need. He's not going to do something different than that. He's your father. He knows what you need. And he will answer. He will do what is best for you. And so pray to him in that way. Now, there have been other times that we've looked at this passage and I spent most of the message talking about the actual prayer itself. This morning, we're not going to take much time to talk about the prayer itself. Let's do look at it. This is, I think, rightly thought of as the disciples' prayer, not the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer is John 17. This is the disciples' prayer, but it's commonly identified as the Lord's prayer. Look at it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's not a declarative statement. That's a request. It's actually saying, God, may your name be holy. So the prayer request is that more and more people would see God as holy. That they would would see the, the name of God as being a holy, sanctified name. And then that, that your kingdom comes. So I I sanctify God, and now we're praying that we would want the rule of God in our hearts. Why? Because we want the will of God to be done. We've come to understand and to treasure the will of God, and so we want God's will to be done. We understand that his way is not only right, it's also good, it's also beautiful. And then many personal needs give us our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Verse 14, then, we do need to see when Jesus then goes back and in this prayer he pulls out the forgiveness part. And remember, those who have been forgiven, if you've really received the forgiveness of God in your heart, then you'll be a forgiver. It's the forgiven who are forgivers. If you're not a forgiver, then Jesus would call into question whether or not you've ever really received the forgiveness. You remember that that servant Jesus uh, told a story about where he comes into his master, his master calls him, and he owes him just an astronomical amount of, of money. There's no possible way he could ever pay that debt back. And the master in his benevolence says, I forgive you the whole debt. Okay, he goes out. He should just be going out doing cartwheels, right? But what does he do? He goes out and Jesus says he finds a fellow servant who owes him a few bucks. And he begins to choke him until he says, you got to pay me the full amount. Didn't turn out good for that guy, by the way, did it? Why not? Because the point of the story is this servant didn't receive the forgiveness. He didn't receive it. How do you know he didn't receive it? Because it didn't change him. If he had received it, if he really did get the love and the mercy and the grace of his master bestowing upon him, if he really had received it, he'd be forgiving everyone their debts. I just got forgiven a debt I could never possibly pay. You owe me ten bucks. It's my joy to forgive you that ten bucks. That's the point, isn't it? So here Jesus is saying, look, if you can't honestly pray, forgive as I forgive others, you haven't received forgiveness. You don't get it. It hasn't changed your heart yet. Now, I really think that that most of you, I'll just say most of you, the vast majority of you, when Jesus says, don't be a hypocrite, you're like, 
I don't want to be a hypocrite. So let me just say these two things this morning. Next week, we're going to take our fourth and final message in talking about this. So there'll be more to say about hypocrisy next week. But for now, let's say these two things as we conclude this morning. Number one, our piety is always in response to God's provision. Here Jesus assumes his people will have an inward devotion to God. He doesn't say if you give and if you pray and if you fast. He says when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Why? Because Jesus assumes his people will pray, will give, will fast because their hearts have been changed by their heavenly father. And if a heart is changed by the Heavenly Father, then he assumes that that heart is going to want to express devotion, love, adoration, worship to their Heavenly Father. So he assumes it. Your heart has been touched by God. That rebellious, rejecting heart is now redeemed, and so therefore it receives from God his provision, his grace, It loves it. It treasures it. One more quick story of Jesus because (laughs) this one tells it all. You'll remember when he's invited in to a dinner with Simon, the Pharisee. And while they're having dinner, there is that woman. Everyone recognizes her because she's identified in that community as a sinner. She comes in and she begins to weep at the feet of Jesus to wash his feet with her hair. And, and Simon, I mean, he's indignant. He doesn't say this out loud, by the way. He doesn't say it out loud, but in his heart, he's, he's appalled at this. Does this man know who's touching him? And Jesus, Luke says, Luke 7, Jesus, knowing his heart, said to him, Hey, Simon, let me tell you a story. Two guys got forgiven. One had a huge, massive debt. The other one, not so much. Who loves the most? Who's the most transformed? Who's going to be the most radically different? Oh, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most, the biggest debt. They would be the most transformed, the most radical. You see, Simon, what this woman is doing is the most rational, it's the most reasonable, it's the most fitting response that she could possibly give. Her heart obviously has been touched, it's been changed. And now her response is to love and worship the one who changed her. Wow, what a beautiful story. What a beautiful picture. What's Jesus saying? What's he pointing out in that? When you receive the provision of God in your heart, that then will overflow to acts of piety, to worship, to glory. And listen, if you get that backwards, you're still lost. Well, that's quite a statement, but I tell you what, it's true. If you get that backwards, you're still lost. If you think, I will be pious in order to get the provision of God, I will give in order to get, I will pray in order to receive, I will fast in order for God to give me something. Listen, you're thinking more different than those pagans who don't know God. I'll manipulate God. I'll give God something, prayer, devotion, adoration, worship, in order to get something from him, and it's the opposite. It's the other way around. He has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves in Christ Jesus. That the Son of God came to this world and He lived a perfect life that He might go in our place to the cross and there take the judgment and wrath of God we deserve for our sin. He gave His life's blood and then was buried but was raised from the dead to prove that his sacrifice he made for your sins was accepted by God. To prove that the victory he promised over sin was real 
Because he rose from the dead, he conquered the consequence of sin, which is death. And when you have received that grace in your heart, it's going to change you. There's going to be a devotion in you. Your good works, your piety, is not to impress others. It's not to draw attention to yourself. It is to point to the one who has done so much for you. That's the whole point of this. Our piety will always be in response to God's provision. Receive it. And then make much of the one who's done so much for you. You know, I was just thinking about this. There's really two good reasons to be here this morning. Think about why you're here this morning. There's two good reasons. If you can think of a third, please tell me. These are the two good reasons I can think that you could be here this morning. One is because you're curious. What really is it to be a Christian? You know, I've seen some Christians, I've been invited by a Christian to come to this church. Sir. What is this all about? You're curious. That's a good reason to be here today. We're all thankful that you're here today. If you're curious and you're not yet a Christian, we are thankful that you're here. The other good reason is gratitude. Your heart has been redeemed by the ransom paid by Christ. Your heart has been redeemed. It has been changed. And now in response to God, for all that he now means to you, for all that he is now to you, you, you come with the people of God in joy to celebrate. At times when your heart is heavy, you come with the people of God to seek and to ask, God, I need your help. I'm weak. I'm broken. But you do that because you know that the one who has filled you in the past will fill you again the one who has helped you in the past will help you again the strength that you've received from God being with the people of God you look to again you're grateful, you're thankful you know where to find the bread you need the bread of life I don't know, if you think of a third reason, let me know. Curiosity and gratitude. You say, well, I come to make my parents happy. Well, if you still live under their authority, you still need to come. I've... But judge your heart if that's why you come. No, not good. Make it look good before others. Keep tradition. After all, I am a member. Why would you come? Why would you come? See, our piety is always going to be in response to God's provision. And then, the hour is late. But certainly, as we look at this text, we need to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Designate a time and place to pray. Let me ask you right now. When will you pray this coming week? What's that place, that quiet place, that private place where you, alone with your Heavenly Father, you're going to open His precious life-giving Word. You're going to open it because you need to hear from Him. You're going to open that Word. You're going to receive it. And then you're going to talk to the Lord. You're going to bring your request to the Lord. Your Father, your Heavenly Father, where are you going to pray when are you going to pray? Decide that right now. Then pray for lost people to be saved. This, what's called the Lord's Prayer, it's highly evangelistic. Because the only way someone's going to sanctify God in their heart, they're going to see his name as holy, is if that heart's been changed. The only way they're going to pray for the kingdom to come and God's will to be done is if their heart has been changed. That's radically evangelistic praying. And ask God, for his forgiveness, like Jesus told Peter, you don't need complete forgiveness again. You don't need a bath. You just need your feet washed. God, wash my feet. 
I see the tendencies of this heart of mine to be hypocritical. Wash my feet. Help me, God, to wash the feet of others. And oh, God, help me fight sin. Oh, help me fight sin. There's more to be said about hypocrisy, but let's this morning commit to the Lord this understanding. Our piety will always be in response of his provision. Have you received his provision in Christ? And then let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Not standing up to stand out, but going to that quiet place at that specific time. Not trying to manipulate God into something but honestly, sincerely bringing our requests to him, letting those requests be shaped by what Jesus teaches here. Let's pray as he taught us to pray. Father, thank you so much for your word today. I thank you, God, for this congregation here at Emmanuel, for their, their desire to receive this word. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us now to receive this I pray, Father, that whatever the need that we have, maybe we do need to recommit ourselves to praying as Jesus taught us to pray. Father, maybe there's an issue of forgiveness that we need to get straight. Maybe we need to let forgiveness flow because it's so freely flowed to us. Oh, Lord God, work in our hearts. Help us to respond in faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.